I want to bring in the neuroscience perspective here. I mean, these words like meaning or happiness, is there, is there kind of a, neuro, a neurobiology explanation? For oh, those, 100%. Those so for both. And uh, in terms of pure hedonism, uh, we know that that's biologically driven by the various neurochemicals, particularly dopamine, uh, which has a lot of effect on increasing the uh, perceptual uh, emotional balance of an experience. So if everyone was, would drink a, a large cup of coffee or take Ritalin before this conference, they probably would think that what I'm talking about would be more interesting than it actually is because it would raise their dopamine and say, wow, this is really a fascinating topic. Um, and by the way, you know, we, we actually coerce children in a, in a certain way to uh, focus uh, on, on information in the educational system. Uh, um, and I think all neurologists are guilty of this to a certain extent where we are apt to label kids as being ADD who are just simply bored. Uh, and they go to the healthcare provider and they get a medication that increases their dopamine so that they go back to school and now they attend because the brain has been tricked into thinking that this has more emotional value than the experience actually does. So we, we do know that, that uh, things like happiness uh, do have a biological substrate. Uh, we also know that, that our brains, as, as much as we like to think that we could figure all this out, uh, our brains are purely operating on belief system. Everything that, that we do is a belief. Uh, and I know that's, it's scary to confront that, but it, the, it, the absolute truth is that uh, you, cognition and belief are, are synonymous. Um, and there's many examples of how one could point out that connection, but even if you don't believe, you are still believing something. So there's always an affirmation process. And science, quite frankly, is the, is the idea of actually confirming something uh, that is definitive and we know that we've uh, sort of taken away sort of the ability of science to, to objectify things. Uh, we know that, we, that science can never fully objectify experience. Um, and most scientists who really understand science realize that, that science is, is, is subjective. Um, it's, it's reality by consensus, which is good, because then you have consensual behavior. Uh, but we shouldn't fool ourselves into thinking that what we believe or what we don't believe, uh, we can validate through science because we can't. But, but wait a minute, there are some things, I mean, to some extent I'm with you, but, but only, to, only up to a point. Certainly there are things, certain things that are objectively demonstrable, scientifically revealable, and so on and so forth. Uh, like, for instance, most of us, I assume, tonight will leave this auditorium using the elevator, not jumping off the window. And that's because we accept the existence of gravity and, and that it works in a certain way, right? So that's objective. That's, not, that's got nothing to do with my belief or not belief. If I don't believe it, I can jump off the window and then I'm going to splash on the, on the, at the bottom of the, of, the, of the building. So some things are certainly uh, can be objectified, as you say. When, when it comes to first-person experience, that's, then I agree with you, that for sure. So my, the, the experience that I'm having in this particular moment of this of these audience of you guys and, and of talking and so on and so forth, uh, that is my own experience and nobody else can ever get into my mind and have the same exact experience. The science can do certain things with that experience. You can do a brain scan in this moment, and you can show which areas of my brain are lining up and which one not. You can take my, my pulse, my pressure, and so on. You can come up with a number of, of quantitative measures of what's happening to my body, but certainly my first-person experience remains my first-person experience. Right. The, the, the only caveat on that is that I, I worry when people say, no, you, didn't, you didn't say, but there are some philosophers even, like Thomas Nagel, for instance, Michael, <laughs> um, who say, well, see, uh, your first person experience is yours and nobody else can get into it. It cannot be put into a third person uh, description. Therefore, that's a limitation of science. That's, that's a failure of science. Um, and I look at that and say, bah. It, the, the, what uh, people like that are, are doing is what in philosophy is called a category mistake. Right. Right? A category mistake is when you try to apply a category or a description to something that actually doesn't bear it. So if I were to say, you know, I were to ask you guys, you know, what is the color of triangles? You might think for a second that I'm being deep here. It's like, wow, what, do you, what does he mean by that? Um, but no, I'm just making a categorical mistake, mistake because uh, triangles are not characterized by colors. They're characterized by angles and by 
sides, but not colors, right? So when somebody says, well, science is limited or it fails because it does not uh, objectify first person experience, I think they're making a categorical mistake. Science is simply not in the business of doing that sort of stuff. Right. Right? Yep. Well, hey, we agree. <laughs> <laughs> I think we, I think we, we, should, we should quit. <laughs>